at the bottom of my funnel is my 8,888 first edition Pudgy Penguin Ethereum NFTs. That is the first edition and the origin story of my entire company and my entire business. It is the asset that gives you utility and access that no other asset in our business gives you. It is the asset that allows you to monetize and be a part of the growth, right? Because every product and every piece of content that we make, we actually license the NFT from the, from the collection and make products out of that. And so you can make monies on royalties. That is the nucleus and where all value, in my opinion, has to accrue uh, if this is really going to win. This episode is brought to you by Synthetics, the liquidity layer for DeFi derivatives. With Synthetics V3, any protocol can now tap into Synthetics liquidity to bootstrap derivatives markets. You'll hear more about Synthetics later in the show. This episode is brought to you by Carbon. Carbon is a new DEX on Ethereum that makes concentrated liquidity super easy. With Carbon, LPs can now automate your liquidity strategy with custom on-chain limit and range orders, all from a beautiful UI. Check out Carbon today for unprecedented control over your liquidity. Welcome back to another episode of Empire. Uh, we are here with Luca. I, w I hope you guys are watching this one on YouTube because Luca's looking uh, as ridiculous and decked out as possible today. So, Luca, man, you uh, you got your bull market your bull market fit on today, huh? Dude, I'm proliferating, man. I'm proliferating. <laughs> well, we got a little nouns. We got a little penguins. I love it. We usually don't talk about people's background going go in in uh in these conversations, but I was doing a little research for this episode. You got a pretty wild story, man. Like high school dropout. Uh, packing boxes at, at ring the like doorbell company early days get asked to like jump up onto the engineering team it sounded like maybe you can just like i don't know maybe we could start there with with just your early days and the, the early story and like how you kind of turned into who you are today if, if, if that works for you yeah and in hindsight it definitely is a cool story i didn't really realize it until i started speaking it in web3 and then everyone's like dude the story is pretty badass and i was like oh shit i didn't even realize it but the story is kind of badass <laughs> Um, the 60 second version is grew up homeless with my mom uh, for 10 years, 14 different places, bouncing around guest bedroom to guest bedroom, couch to couch. Uh, we weren't homeless, like pushing a cart, but we didn't really have our own home. And whoever would take us in and let us stay for an extended period of time was kind of uh, we were nomads, to say the least. Uh, we settled down when I was uh, a teenager in Los Angeles, uh, went to Fairfax High School, went to a couple different high schools. Actually, it was a bad kid, super skateboarder, you know, degenerate, just smoking weed with my friends, way too young to be smoking weed, skateboarding, <laughs> doing the whole spiel. Um, then I went to Fairfax, dropped out of Fairfax. Mom was still struggling to pay the bills. A couple really big moments that led me to that decision. I uh, won't dive into it, but I was old enough to work. And so I decided to join the workforce. I took 100 resumes, went up and down Fairfax and Melrose, handing them out. Didn't find any luck. Took my tail to uh, Tech Row in Santa Monica. I went to the shittiest office on the row, which if you know Tech Row and you know Santa Monica, you know Ring Doorbell's first office was very much that. It was a, a shack amongst a, a bunch of titans and giants and amazing buildings, and it had this little rinky dink shack that they had going on. I uh, got a job packing boxes. I was one of their first people back packing boxes, one of their early employees. Saw that business basically go from idea or new iteration from Doorbot to Ring and just saw that thing basically scale from a group of 20, 25 of us to 1,000 people, 500 people by the time I left. Uh, I started my first direct-to-consumer business when I was 18, sold that business for quite a bit of money when I was 19. That kind of put me on the paradigm of like, hey, life-changing money. And then uh, started a couple companies, all of which were really successful. Notable big wins was I was the CMO of Von Dutch, brought them back. Uh, pretty much from the dead, which was a big moment in 2020, and then was the CMO and biggest investor at the time for a company called Gel Blaster, which ended up being North America's fastest growing toy company. Uh, and honestly, just a complete nerf killer. And so that led <laughs> me and gave me the confidence to come into Pudgy Penguins. Uh, and we're trying to go three for three here. There we go. I love it, man. All right. So take us back to April 2022. Because uh, I, I, you know, I kind of followed the Pudgy, the Pudgy story from like, early days and it was uh it was in shambles I would, I would call it i think that's a fair thing to say and you came in april 2022 it, I, I i think it's fair to say pudgy penguins felt kind of dead in the water as a project and you bought them for i think it was 750 eth at the time which 
roughly two and a half, two and a half half million million? local top. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. So what, what, uh, what gave you that conviction to buy penguins at for two and a half million bucks? I think what does that even mean by the way, to buy, do you buy the, you're buying the company? Yeah, behind the, there, there, there was no company. So we bought okay. a bunch of assets, like 60 different assets, even some of the previous teams as social media accounts. Uh, so anything and everything under the sun, this wasn't a, a, you know, there hadn't been a deal like this that had been done before. So it's kind of historic in its own right. So there really was no case law or deal to kind of reference. We kind of constructed it, which is one of the reasons why it took a little bit longer than I wanted to. I think we got the bid accepted in December and didn't go through until April. Uh, so it was a it was a rough ride to kind of get the deal done, to say the least. You know why? I think if you believe in NFTs and you believe in digital collectibles and you're me, then it seemed like an obvious purchase. I thought two and a half million dollars was incredibly cheap, figuring the business had netted seven million dollars in six months prior. So if you just do the math on like a PE multiple or like a traditional acquisition, it was like an obvious acquisition. Or the, really, the business like, had done seven million revenue or to the bottom line? Uh, seven million dollars profit, all said and done, wow. after all expenses, give or take. Wow. Uh, there really was no expenses in their business prior to that. I mean, they had a couple employees, but they sure. pretty much were just taking revenue and dividing it amongst themselves with their respective percentages and breaking bread that way. Hmm. Um, so you know, seven million dollars, let's call it seven and a half million dollars gross, seven million dollars net in six months. You buy that, that you buy that business for two and a half million dollars because it's a distressed asset. I actually was ready to pay seven and a half. That was my top offer. I just hit them with my first low ball, which was two and a half, and they took it. Um, (laughs) Why? I think if you look under the hood and if you believe in NFTs and you believe in PFPs and you believe them to be the future of IP and the future of brands, which I think there's a really strong argument that they are, then two and a half million dollars for a pudgy penguin, which basically, if you really understand what makes an NFT project successful, there's certain ingredients. And Pudgy Penguins had all of those ingredients, had a diehard community, had an affluent community, right? Like there's people who own Pudgy Penguins who you could never buy. You could never fundraise and get these people on board or pay them to buy your project. They're just either in it or they're not. The IP was clearly magical, right? People were buying the Pudgy Penguin not because of any future utility or because there was tokens coming or some sort of Ponzi-nomic North Star. They were buying it because they loved the Penguin and people loved the Penguin. The Penguin personally made me feel something. I don't know what it was, but there was a phenomenon that every time I scrolled through my OpenSea, the Penguin always made me feel even just 1% better. And I started to notice that and identify that. And I thought that was magic. You either have it or you don't. And then you kind of just put all of these things like the historical significance, right? One of the first early PFP projects, probably the leader in Qt IP on the blockchain, which Qt IP is the total addressable, has the highest TAM out of any of the IPs in the space. You look at the fact that it was printed in the New York Times, all over CNBC, on the, the Today Show, and all of these like major news networks. That's two and a half million dollars in marketing alone and brand awareness alone, right? You just like add all the pieces together and the facets together, and you're just like, dude, you know, seven and a half million dollars was more than I was was the max that I could afford, but I yeah, probably would have paid fifteen for it if I had more money, and so. Uh, two and a half is the offer they took. I thought it was a screaming deal. I thought anybody who I thought everybody who was in the space at the time that was building in the space that had the money to buy it that didn't miss out on a generational opportunity because it was a no brainer acquisition if you really understood it. And uh, we basically took over the business April 2022. No money in the bank. Bootstrapped it for about the first 12 months. Raised around, and uh, I think we've put on a master class in NFT brand building and what it means to be the next iteration of IP in the world, uh, leveraging NFT hmm. technology and uh, Web3 community. Nice, man. Did you buy it? Uh, I don't know if this is too personal of a question to ask, but did you raise the round first, then you bought it? Did you buy it with cash? Did you no, get we, we bought it, or We bought it with our own money. So I, spent, nice. I, I had the majority, but then the other people on the C-level suite uh, basically all put their money put their own money. I, how the story went was the opportunity came. I made a couple phone calls. I had a couple big wins under my belt prior. So people, when I call people with an opportunity, they tend to listen. And I basically said, I think this is a generational once in a lifetime opportunity. I want you to buy in. The business has no money, so I won't be able to pay you a salary, but I want you to stop everything that you're doing and just devote your life to this. Thankfully, every single person that I spoke to and had that conversation with said they wanted in. Uh, and it's been a wild ride ever since, but for the first nine months, nobody on the C-level team was getting paid. 
They all were working for free and they actually spent hundreds of thousands of dollars of their own money to be in the position to work for free for this company to build this brand, which is like, if you people understand that story and like <laughs> ever thought we were going to fail has like another yeah. thing coming. Yeah. 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 Um, Man, that's funny. So the, the backstory of this episode, I don't know if I told you this, but uh, so Mike, you did this uh, like road to permissionless, like Twitter spaces with uh, the bankless guys. And then I wasn't able to make it, but Mike, the other BlockWorks co-founder and uh, you know, Mike's about as like bearish on some of these, like, basically bearish, not bearish NFTs, but bearish NFT business models as you can possibly get. Um, and I think it comes from some personal experience that we've had. And uh, he, he gets off that thing, gives me a call. He goes, man, this Luca guy just red pilled me as basically as hard as hard as I've ever been red pilled on uh, not just NFTs but the but but you know penguins and and the business behind these. So maybe we can get into the business model of NFTs and really just the business model of of pudgies. Uh, so what what was the business model of pudgies before you acquired them, and what is like the how are you changing that and. Yeah, maybe we could start with that. Yeah, I think the business model prior was, hey, create hype, uh, tell a narrative, hope people believe that narrative, mint a collection, make an exorbitant amount of money for little to no effort on royalties, and uh, make and pray that your floor price goes higher so you can release a secondary collection and make even more money and hope that collection goes in the money and then you can do a third collection and Hopefully, if God is on your side and the and the market is on your side, you could come out of there with a hundred million bucks. You know, being relatively an amateur in entrepreneurship, I think was probably the business model before. Um, I think so. The, the business market, model was mints and royalties, basically. That's that's yeah. been the business model. Mints and royalties. Yeah. yeah, just just make digital things. It's a very simple and easy business model. Uh, made a lot of people really wealthy who probably wouldn't have made that wealth any other way. Uh, but I think it's since transition, the bear market has humbled that business model. I knew coming into this that I needed to make real money in the real world. Just uh, my my tip for entrepreneurs listening, you know, to be a good entrepreneur is to control your own destiny. When you're making a business that's dependent on outside variables you can't control, i.e. Ethereum royalties or Ethereum volatility, then you do not control your own destiny and you don't really have a business. And so I knew this. I look at royalties as EBITDA patterns, kind of the cherry on top, the thing that makes your books look good at the end of the year that kind of covers your margin. Maybe, you know, some it allows you to take a little more risk. Right. But it is not the core revenue driver and it is not the thing that's going to take you uh, where you need to be. And so very early on, mm -hmm. we knew we needed to create real products. We needed to transcend outside of this eco chamber and outside of this ecosystem. And uh, the first step for that, looking at the Pudgy Penguin IP and coming from, you know, the toy business right before in Gel Blaster, I was like, well, toys, plushies, collectibles, you know, high end mm -hmm. figurines is kind of the first direction that we're going. And so that was our approach. I think that model allows a lot of flexibility and adds a huge safety net for our collectors. The The biggest blue chip killer in the NFT space has been diluting supply when there's not enough demand. And so very much like a physical product, uh, you know, why is a one of one Picasso worth $10 million versus a Picasso print of 250 worth 10,000 because one is 250 and then another is the original and the one of one. The same principle applies to these digital products. And actually, I think hyper applies because the it's so transparent and you and the liquidity is migrates in so many different tides that you can see pretty early on if, if something's going to go kaput or not. And so this dependency on minting and making new collections was either derived from two things. One, greed, which you can't really control. People are going to be greedy. Or second, the inability to make money elsewhere and needing to sustain the business and knowing the only way to make money was through mints because they had been rewarded for that behavior in the past. They continue to do it, which ultimately crushes the entire business. And so, you know, when people think toys, well, how does toys make sense? Well, I would argue it gives me the safety net to actually build a long term digital collectible that will accrue real value because I'm not diluting my digital supply with endless mints because I'm self sustaining. Um, and then I would also argue that it grows my top of the funnel. It creates more emotional attachment between holder and family and friend. It creates more awareness on different shelves on your favorite retailers and on commercials and ad spots that you 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 otherwise wouldn't have done if you just sold a digital collectible all day. And then just gives us a, a better moat to actually succeed long term. The nature of our deal was very much position for long-term thinking because we bought this thing for two and a half million bucks. It's not like I can just jump ship a year later and go on to the next thing. You know, no matter how much money I have, two and a half million dollars is no small amount. And, and you got it and, and you committed to something. And I really put my reputation on the line on this one. And so 
Um, all mm. things considered, that's kind of our business model with our toys. Obviously, the 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 depth of what we want to do is a lot bigger and grander than that. But that was really our first step coming into this was how do we become self-sustaining? How do we control our destiny? And how do we ultimately you know, create products and experiences that people love that other people can enjoy without having to pay you know, $10,000 for an internet JPEG? Hmm. All right. So once you make that decision to get into the into the toy business, which obviously it sounds like you were pretty familiar with that business, I feel like there's one a decision that had to be made, which is do we sell toys to the to the world? Do we become a toy company? Or do we basically sell, do what has kind of existed, which is like we'll give our existing community uh almost like token token walled toys, we give it away for free, and that drives the price of these of these pudgies higher. Or do we get into the toy business and just sell toys like a normal toy company and pudgies because toys are proliferating around the world, but the value of pudgies gets higher. How do you think about like, how did you think about that decision? Yeah, I think, I think just proliferation, how I look at it is just like a funnel, right? So at the bottom of my funnel is my 8,888 first edition pudgy penguin Ethereum NFTs. That mm. is the first edition and the origin story of my entire company and my entire business. It is the asset that gives you utility and access that no other asset in our business gives you. It is the asset that allows you to monetize and be a part of the growth, right? Because every product and every piece of content that we make, we actually license the NFT from the from the collection and make products out of that. And so you can make monies on royalties, right? Like that is the nucleus and where all value, in my opinion, has to accrue uh, if this is really going to win. And so when you're thinking about hmm. proliferation and expanding, right, really what I need to focus on is this top of the funnel, right? Because the broader this top of the funnel, the more people that love this pudgy penguin character, the more people that, you know, wake up and enjoy the product or the content every single day, the more people that are familiar with it, right? When the tides of the NFT narrative and FOMO kick back in because the NFT market is very cyclical. Uh, is very cycle oriented the same way that you know a coin market is or the stock market is when that cycle comes back and people are starting to collect nfts they're probably going to migrate to the one that they're most familiar with or the one that's proven themselves the one that is tangible and the one that feels real and then by that time i plan to have the most followers and the most views and the most impressions and the most retail sales and the best partnerships and the best collaborations when that time comes and then you just become the obvious first choice because you've you've done it, you've proliferated, and so my my job right now is just how do I create product and content that people love, and how do I just grow that top of the funnel? I'm not selling them on NFTs right now. I'm not selling them on Web three. I'm really selling them on a cute, iconic, prolific pudgy penguin character, which I believe is the best penguin ever drawn. People love penguins. People love Arctic animals. We will be the face for that. And that's really where I'm going. And we're really a brand for young people, you know, middle-aged people and older people. Like it's a, a complete nucleus of like, do you believe in this ethos? Do you believe in this vision of a character that's here to make you smile, to make you feel good? Do you want to support that? Because that character supports you. And I think ultimately mm -hmm. it trickles down to the first edition. The the NFT is a better collectible, right? It is better than a Pokemon card. It is better than anything out there. And so if you can even capture 10% or 15% or 20% of the awareness of a Pokemon per se, I would argue the first edition NFTs, because of the non-factor of inauthenticity issues, the non-factor of spoofing, the complete clarity on quantity and rarity, the no friction of buying and selling, which is the nature of the NFT, I would argue that all you need is 10% of the awareness that Pokemon has for your first editions, which in this case is our Pudgy Penguin NFT to be worth more than first edition Pokemon cards because the the, the <laughs> scalability of the NFT just removes all the, all the friction, right? It just makes it so much more tradable. Sorry for the monologue, yeah. but I hope that paints a pretty clear picture. It does paint a clear picture. And as you were uh, monologuing there, I actually looked to my left. I just realized this. I swear to you, I did not set this up. I have not many things on my desk. I do have this cute little penguin logo, uh, Lego though. And the reason I have it is because penguins are fucking cute. So, <laughs> and this is, this is um, the thing. This is an interesting one. I hate to interrupt, but people like when you're just looking at like, okay, what, why does this matter? People love penguins. Do not underestimate the love for certain animals. People, people love, love penguins. penguins. This thing is so cute. There's a penguin skating around. It's got little skates on. It's a cute thing. And, so, what, and, so what's the top of the funnel? 
or go ahead, go ahead. And, and you fact check it, but this is the best. They've made penguins ugly historically. Why? I don't know. But penguins are cute. This is the cutest penguin ever made. And I can tell you this is somebody who's went through all the penguin IPs. The top of the funnel for me is touch points, views, impressions, and followers. That's how I quantify it, right? Like we have five, we have 6 billion views on our Giphy, right? Touch point one. We get, you know, 50 million accounts reach on our Instagram every single month. Touch point two. We get 5 million accounts reach on our Twitter every single month. Touch point three. I'm in, you know, at the end of the year, I'll be in 5,000 retail stores around the country. Touch point four. If I just get to seven touch points, then I'm a legitimate brand. And if I if they love the product and I can do it consistently, then I'm on the on the path to being a legacy brand, right? And so for me, it's just top of the funnel is just knowing and loving, right? When you think penguin, do you think pudgy penguins, right? If I can if I can accomplish that, I've won. Uh, it's easier said than done, though. Again, it's like if it was so easy to do, it'd be done. But you know, we're in we're working in that direction and slowly but surely getting there. Uh, you guys have, I had, I had, I don't follow you guys. You guys have 683,000 followers on Instagram. This is nuts. I would I encourage people to pull this up, spreading good vibes and positivity. Wait, so are these videos or are these pictures? Oh, these are, yeah. I see what you're going for. These are cute. And these go, these go viral outside of just, wow, this one got 15,000 likes. This is nuts. That's crazy. So these are not, wow, 48,000 likes. That's, that's nuts. So you guys are reaching a Damn, this video got 109,000 likes. I haven't seen this. I should have researched this before. So you guys are reaching a completely non-crypto audience with this, basically. This is like you're a toy yeah. brand selling toys. You're building a big top of funnel. Yeah, it's just the character, right? That's it's just crazy. like, how do you get the 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 pudgy penguin to transcend? And the video after the one with 109,000 likes is a million likes, right? And so, like, how do you really just, oh, just this is again, nuts. just create a character? Yeah. Yeah. How do you create a character that people love and they know and they identify and resonate with? And then as long as you have that familiarity, you can push them in any direction that they want. But the problem is with NFTs today is everyone's trying to force them into a crypto blockchain web three NFT narrative. What people don't really understand is hmm. crypto blockchain NFTs web three. That's the back end. It is not the front end. It is not the selling point. It is the biggest mistake out of all of these major web three crypto blockchain oriented brands is everybody's trying to sell them the front end as if it's it, it's really just a back end it's not mm. a front end and so you know that's the play that i'm taking right like what people don't know just to give you some uh context you know because i think this is really important you know every toy that we sell comes with a birth certificate and on that birth certificate there's a qr code and on that QR code, it basically allows you to sign up via an email and a password to create your own Pudgy World account. And that Pudgy World account basically is a custody wallet solution that you basically stand up via an email and a password. When you redeem the code that you were given after you sign up from your purchase of your $10 toy, you unlock a trait box that gives you four NFTs via a gasless experience for free. That's how I onboard people. I onboard people by selling $10 toys that has a QR code and a birth certificate that points you to make a blockchain wallet without you knowing and giving you your first NFT and digital collectible at zero cost to you. We cover the gas. And all of a sudden, you're having fun. You're digitally collecting, but you don't even know it's an NFT. And slowly but surely, you're becoming familiar with the habits of what it is to digitally collect, which is no different than you know collecting Fortnite skins or you know attachments on your gun in Call of Duty. And you're just programming them to be familiar with these type of behaviors and this type of flow. And so like people are like, well, why is your toy such a big deal? Why was it so meaningful? Well, dude, I'm not only bringing NFT IP to the real world, right? Because this character that you see on your screen is actually an NFT that is owned by one of our holders. And every time one of this <laughs> toy sells, he gets a royalty in perpetuity that gets paid out annually. So not only are we telling the story of NFT IP and the story of Web3 brand building, which is really what that relationship is, we're also telling the story of bringing NFT technology to the hands of everyday people. Because when somebody walks down the shelf of your favorite retail store this quarter four and they pick up a pudgy penguin and they follow the steps and the instructions in the box, they will have a blockchain wallet within five minutes of them opening up this toy. And that's mass adoption, that's proliferation, that's pushing the boundaries, that's a forward-facing consumer product. That's the difference between us and what everybody else is doing. Everybody's looking inwards and we're looking outwards. And that's why I'm so passionate that we are going to win and that we are going to be the number one, because I think nobody else is really doing it like we're doing it. Hmm. 
Luca, man, you got the confidence. That's for sure. I like it. Um, how much have you studied club, uh, club, club penguin? You remember that game? Yeah. I've talked to, uh, the, I've talked to the founders multiple times now. <laughs> they had a nice um, legs. I think they sold for like 350 million bucks or something with another 300 of bonuses. 700. 700. 700. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that, that was interesting, right? Uh, who, who bought, who bought club penguin? I think it was Disney who bought club penguin, Disney. right? So what you got, I mean, what you guys are building here is basically just an IP house and you monetize in a bunch of different ways. And the way that IP houses today monetize in a bunch of different ways. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Well, not a toy business or I'm not an NFT business or I'm not any specific business. I'm an IP business. I live and die by the awareness of my character. My character is not relevant. I'm not relevant. My character is relevant. I'm relevant. I'm printing money 10 different ways. Just to give you an idea you know, an IP company is really the broadest version of what these character brands can be. You know, some, I, I've never understood why an NFT company would call themselves a gaming company or, or right. whatever, because in reality, IP encompasses all of it. I can have the next Club Penguin. I can have the next Happy Feet. I can have, you know, all of the things that everybody else does. And it all funder, falls under the same category, which is IP. Yeah. How do you think about um, uh, licensing IP? Movies, films, commercials, I'm sure there's other stuff that goes into licensing. How do you think about that? Yeah, I think uh, from our end, a huge a huge case study that we want to prove is how do you democratize IP? Mm-hmm. And I think that the democratization for us is how do you turn the relationship between brand and consumer to brand and participant, right? Right now, when Disney uh, ships a new IP, the relationship between the person who's consuming that is very much the relationship between brand and consumer, when Pudgy Penguins releases, you know, in this case, Pudgy Penguins is our flagship IP. You know, when we go and build and, and create movies and, and stories and toys and products, the brand and participant relationship comes into play because every piece of product, every piece of content, everything that we make, we actually license from the holder to actually use that character. And the thought process is, well, we have 8,888 Pudgy Penguin characters that have been minted on the blockchain. Why am I gonna go and draw a bunch of different characters and keep all of that value to myself? At the end of the day, I'm going to win if my community rally behind me. And if they rally behind me, what is that incentive model that keeps us you know, aligned by the hip. And I think that that value accrual, when you think about like, what does the NFT holder really want? Well, the elephant in the room is the ele- the NFT holder wants monetary gain to pretend that they don't uh, is a fool's errand. The same reason why you might buy a sports card. Majority of people buying sports cards today just want to flip it for more money. And so that's okay. That's an okay behavior. And I understand that. But how do you create a monetary value accrual funnel that is not Ponzi nomics, i.e. creating NFTs out of thin air or tokens out of thin air and just dropping it into people's wallets? Because that's not sustainable, nor is that really real, in my opinion. It can be done once or twice or three times, but over the mm-hmm. course of 20 years, how many new imaginary things are you going to airdrop into people's wallets? How are you really going to sustain monetary value accrual? I think the answer to that is licensing. Every time I make a toy, I can go give somebody a percentage of that toy every time it sells, and I can take their character out. And I think the the the, the hit I'll take on the margin will supersede the extra marketing and hyper galvanization around that narrative to kind of push the brand even further. And so licensing to me is the ultimate solution for Web3 NFT projects and community and the best way to accrue value and provide utility for your community unequivocally. I've thought of this long and hard. Huh. And the only legitimate way to do it is through licensing. And then on the flip side, licensing for me from as a pudgy penguin business owner, I mean, being in the IP business, licensing is the business that I'm in. You look at Pokemon and Hello Kitty, they make billions of dollars a year. Look at their books. They're making all of that money from licensing. They are not making that money making or incubating anything themselves. Sure, they might do one or two products, sure. but you know that money is just throwing your stuff and, and collecting a check. I feel like different projects like Doodles and Nouns and stuff have played around with different licensing models. Like there's the model of um, like very... I haven't followed it too closely, but I think nouns, like anyone can take their noun and do anything with it. Then there's like doodles where it's like, if you do something under a hundred, I don't, I'm going to botch this fact, but like under a hundred K something happens over a hundred K something else happens. How do you think about like bottoms up, like decentralized licensing and like, will, like if I own a pudgy, can I do anything with it? Can I do anything up to a certain dollar amount with it? Do we have to split the dollars there? How does that work? Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty interesting, it's, it's a, an agreement that we spend a lot of time going under. Uh, you know, for me, ownership is really monetization. Like what is it to really own something? I think it's like kind of like a vague term. And in, again, this is, I won't expect you to follow up with this, but 
there's there's a lot of interesting court cases going on right now where it, there's a lot of conjecture to kind of remove that conjecture i just made it pretty simple look we are a brand for everybody so you can do what you want with your penguin as long as it's not harmful sexist racist or something weird right we have a brand to protect and you know i'm definitely not going to allow you to do some explicit video using a pudgy penguin to you know cause harm to anybody that's like just not our ethos so i do have the right to control that and I do have in our agreement, there's a $500,000 a year cap, but I told the community that it's really a placebo for anybody who's a genuine holder and really put in place so that a big brand doesn't circumvent doing a deal with me. I.e., you know, if there's a 500 cap on my pudgy penguin, Starbucks is not going to go buy a pudgy penguin and circumvent me. Like they're just going to, you know, work with me because, you know, they're not in the business of 500 grand right. being a, right. a meaningful needle mover. But I told the community, look, at the end of the day, I've extended that license every single time somebody's asked that I've known has been a part of this community, uh, like in a real and in a real non like uh, extraction, trying to use the IP way. And uh, like somebody came to me for a burger joint and said, hey, like, I don't want to I'm not going to do this if I can only make a half a million dollars doing it or I have to split the money. And I'm like, dude. Signed this. We set up the agreement five minutes later, signed on your way. Go make as much money on that pudgy penguin well, burger joint yeah. as you want. Nice. Uh, I think I'm in the business of making money and being sustainable. And so I think I don't really believe in the whole like complete free for all. I think there's too much risk when there's a free for all. Yeah, Society, just human. Yeah. Humans in general haven't done well in this whole free for all. People think they want a free for all, but you actually don't. Like law and order or some sort of boundaries, I think have been really healthy uh, for the human race for a very long time. And this like complete, just nonchalant, do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, I actually think doesn't work the way that people wish it would work. Let's face it, concentrated liquidity is hard. And that's why I'm super excited to partner with Carbon for Empire. Carbon is a new DEX on Ethereum that makes concentrated liquidity easy. With Carbon, LPs can now automate your liquidity strategy with custom on-chain limit orders and range orders. Want to buy a token when it dips and sell it when it spikes? With Carbon, you can now set a strategy that buys in on one price range and sells in a higher range on repeat using a single source of automated rotating liquidity. Strategies can be created for any standard ERC-20 token. I recently checked out the Carbon Beta that just dropped, pretty blown away by the liquidity strategies that Carbon enables on-chain. It has these rich trading features that you'd expect from a centralized exchange, except Carbon is fully on-chain, decentralized, and non-custodial. Just connect your wallet. It's CarbonDeFi.xyz. That's CarbonDeFi.xyz. Choose a trading pair, set your buy and sell ranges and amounts, hit create, and you're done. Carbon automatically moves your liquidity into your selected ranges as the market moves. LPs, it is time to take back control of your liquidity with Carbon. Check out the link and get started today. Now, let's get back to Empire. All right, folks, it is time to talk about one of my and a lot of your favorite DeFi protocols, Synthetix. Synthetix has been pushing the limit in DeFi innovation since 2017 and has just started its most exciting transition yet with Synthetix V3. With Synthetix V3, any protocol can now tap into Synthetix liquidity to bootstrap derivatives markets. The transition has already started with Synthetix Perps. Synthetix Perps taps into Synthetix's liquidity layer and is a new primitive that developers can leverage to launch DeFi derivatives. The Perps product has been going incredibly well so far. Hopefully you've seen it. It's had some great traction hitting 500 million in daily volume this March. We know that liquidity rules DeFi and Synthetix is becoming the modular liquidity layer for DeFi derivatives. As a trader, you can trade Synthetix Perps with low fees in over 20 different markets at Quenta.io, Decentrix.com, and Polynomial.fi. And this opportunity set keeps growing with 10 new partners in the pipeline ready to launch integrations on top of Synthetix, including front ends, structured products, and institutional offerings. The team gave me a sneak peek of all this stuff. It's really cool. Would really recommend you check out Synthetix.io forward slash perps to learn more. And if you're looking to build on Synthetix, hop into their Discord server, reach out to the team directly. Make sure to tell them that Empire and Santi and Yano sent you. Again, synthetics.io forward slash perps. You can also hop into the Discord server and reach out to the team directly. All right, so take me back to this toy drop. When So you guys launched, what are they called, plushies, I think they are? 
Yeah, plushies, collectibles, mystery igloos. We launched a couple SKUs. You can 16. buy them on Amazon. I was looking at these. I, got, I'm, I might snag one of these. Um, how how uh, how much money did you guys make from this? A uh, million dollars in the first couple of days, just under. Not bad. Not bad. Can yeah. you share? Can you share other finance? Like, so you guys bought it for two and a half. It was doing seven seven and a half gross, seven net roughly. Like, how do you think you guys are tough market for NFTs in 2023? Like, yeah. how do you think you're going to do this year? next year yeah so we uh we bought the business for two and a half million dollars april 4th of 2022 if you look at april 4th 2022 it literally was pico top like that day mm -hmm. was literally the top 3400 eth is when i exchanged it it was down only ever since we went hit lows as low as 850 and uh first year in revenue we did about 1.8 this year we're on track to do six and a half seven um with half of that coming from uh, physical products and and self sustaining, and so like, you know, our, our burn is less than that, and so hopefully we'll have a profitable year in a really down bear market. And that's great. If man. I can just keep doubling revenue every year, we'll be in a good spot. That's great, man. I mean, it's been impressive. You, uh, what, what, what was the price of uh, what was the floor price of Pudgies when you when you bought them? Point seven five. What's it at now? Like three and a half, four. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, not bad, man, in this market. Um, what's the team look like? Is it uh, all dude, is, uh, is it content creators? Like how do you how do you build a team around this? Yeah, it's it's a it's a it's it's a bitch of a business because there's so many layers. Like yeah. you know, keep in mind just that Instagram alone, there's people who do that that type of Instagram stuff, and that's like their whole life business, just so you know. Like there's yeah, like yeah, eight businesses within one. Um so Thankfully, the way that I assembled it was very Avenger style. I knew I was coming into a tall task and I knew, but I knew the upside was there and I knew I needed the best. So I basically took the best six people I've ever worked with in my life. And I basically said, Hey, I want you guys to be a part of this. You're not going to make any money. I need you to invest some, but the valuation is so cheap. We should be able to beat it within 12 to 18 months time. And it should be a huge home run slam dunk. And they all said yes, but I, I, all of these guys and gals that are on this team, at least like the managers in the C level group, I've all worked with for many years in the past, and we've all crushed it together. So this is like not like this is not like new startup. Like this is very much I've taken big wins, especially with our chief creative officer Peter, who really is like my my uh, or like a dynamic duo, my yin to my yang. I mean, we've got like three or four nine figure wins in terms of like things we were able to like do nine figures a year with. Uh, and so he, he and I really have an amazing groove. We have just a complete stacked team 40. Now we're growing pretty fast. Burns getting nice. a little high, but I want to be aggressive right now. Like now's the time for me where it's like, I'm just, everyone's blowing up, just making mistakes left and right, have no clue really what they're doing. And so this is where I just want to take all the attention and grow the fastest and grow the best. Yeah. So it's interesting. So there's like, so Blockworks media and information platform, we have like two sides of the business media and the research and analytics side of the business. And there's probably, there's, there's like several analytics and research platforms in crypto and there's several media companies. There's probably like one or two in each of those buckets that I think are doing a good job. And like five or six that I'm like enough with enough time, this won't go well for you guys. Probably who, do, yeah. when you look at the NFT space, like you know, I, I think everyone knows the big names. Like, who do you look at, and you're like, "Oh, I actually really respect what you guys are doing." You're you're going at it differently, and but I, you know, but I respect what you're doing. Yeah, without like just shoot without shitting on people, because I'll just tell you the truth, dude. There's only five projects I would ever put my like no one because I know I've seen I know what's behind all the curtains what and are, I'm never going to throw any. What are what are the projects? Yeah, I, I can't I can't okay. I can't do it I can't I can't do it because it would just it would it would autom automatically like alienate people. Fair but right. I will say there's five projects that are worth putting your money behind. Two of them don't need to have any founders running it, with the exception of CryptoPunks. CryptoPunks being an obvious one, and the rest are completely going to zero. I can tell you unequivocally. I'll tell you the person I have the most respect for in the space and the person that I think does the best job is Frank from D-Gods. I think if it's not myself, it's him. And then Yuga. I think Yuga does... I have my own reserve. Like, I'm super Yuga, Board 8 Maxi, just to be clear. Um, I... I'm I, I'm afraid of Yuga's supply and demand thing and the gaming and how it really is going to tie in. Right. I think it's the right business decision for their business. 
I don't know how it is from an NFT collecting standpoint. Uh, we'll see it vague, but Yuga, obviously, we don't even need to talk about them because they're at the top of the totem pole. And until we do any better, then really, I can't say shit. Uh, but if it's not Yuga, it's Frank. And so to me, I, I have to see as me, Frank, them, and, and then I have you know two other picks that would be pretty obvious if you're familiar with the space, but I don't want to tell them because then you'll know everybody else sucks. So it's funny. So I went, so I, uh, I'm going to tie this story back to Frank in a second. So I went to um, Barclays this weekend and uh, Ice Cube started a new basketball league called, uh, yep. it's called Big Three. And I go, so I show up to this league. It's, it's funny league. It's all 3v3 basketball, first to 50 wins. They've got like four point shots and shit. And, uh, you know, there's like Jason Richardson's out there shooting threes. Gilbert Arenas is out there. It's like a bunch of 40, 45 year old retired NBA players. But I'm, I'm, I'm out there on the, like the kind of, courtside VIP like owners area or whatever. Cause like someone I know would invest in one of the companies or something. And uh, I look around, there's probably a hundred people in this area. 70 of them were wearing D God shirts. It was wild. Yeah. Was like D God's army showed up at this thing. So they're, they're out and about. Um, why, why Frank? Just curious. Just, I mean, you guys are both storytellers. Yeah, you, you can just know who really gets it and understands it, who's a complete yeah. critical thinker. I mean, dude, you'd be surprised. A lot of these guys are so freaking checked out and so no critical thinking, no execution, no innovation, trying to redo things that the other guys are doing, no self-thought. Like Frank is a leader. He's a hyper elite marketer. He is a hyper elite brand guy people don't know this like his eye for design is yeah. unlike is i only know one person like it and sorry it's peter but like this guy's incredibly impressive on his design side and they just got the team to do it and some people just get it some people just really really fucking get it and this is the space where it's not about your resume it's not about your experience it's whether you get it or not how many like this whole I, I, the web three space needs to stop falling for it but if they're from google or facebook or disney or warner like, don't let that sell you because that is like, that doesn't mean anything here. It means nothing. You either have a finger on the pulse and you understand culture or you don't. Frank understands culture. One of the reasons why I think we do so well, because we understand culture, right? Like, and, and obviously we can innovate and we can execute and same with him. But uh, the, most of these people are just like, have no finger on the pulse of as what's cool, what's hot, what's hip, what's trending, yeah. you know, like they just, it's like complete like buzzards like in the desert with like not a carcass in sight. So it, it, it's unequivocally hit. He, he, I'm telling you, if, it, if it's not me, it's him. It, I promise. Like I, I obviously I'm going to put myself because that's the person I am. I, I think of myself as the fucking Michael Jordan. Like that's how I wake up every morning. So I will always say that I think I'm the best, but honestly, that's my guy. And I have so much respect. And honestly, I'm not here if it wasn't for him. Cause he totally expanded my horizons and got me to think the right way. Cause I wasn't thinking the right way in the beginning here. Interesting. Um, you mentioned uh, Pudgy's V, like V1 basically. Are, will you guys ever, I know you've been kind of roasting these other things that just drop a bunch of things, but I could see that strategy making sense for you in the future. Not as like a money grab, but as a way to kind of unlock more IP and things like that. Will you guys launch anything else on chain? Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think totally. It's just does, does supply and demand warrant it. Right. Like we're in the midst of a bear. You'd have to be cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs if you're minting anything or adding any digital su extra supply in the bear. Seriously, yeah. it doesn't matter who you are, even Yuga. I think a major of the Yuga's downturn recently is because like, dude, stop unlocking more NFTs right now. Keep the liquidity centralized. Just like a pretty obvious thing to understand. Uh, I think uh, I think, yeah, there's totally introduction for new characters. Just supply demand has to outweigh supply and I have to have clearly more demand than I have supply. And, 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 you know, minting, I'm not shitting on minting. Minting is a great revenue model. It's a great moment to introduce new characters and new story and appeal to new audiences, right? But it's just about supply and demand. Are you ready for it? Is the market ready for it, right? And, and how can you also innovate there? I think the same like 20,000 collection, 10,000 collection. If, if when I start introducing new characters, I'm going to do it a lot differently than it's ever been done. That I'm huh. sure. Nice, man. Um, let's look at the future a little bit. What are you excited about the next, uh, six months back half of the year? Yeah. Yeah, dude. I think, uh, before the year's over, you'll, you'll remember it based on what I tell you today, but I think I have one of the all time great moments and announcements for the NFT space that's ever happened. You know, me being an avid collector and being so involved in the space, I just look back at 
what I know I'm going to announce, you know, in quarter four. And I think to myself, has there been a more meaningful announcement in NFT? And uh, you'd be surprised, but I think I, I, I think there's very few, if any. Um, and so I'm really excited for that. I'm excited for a thing that we've been working for a long time on called Project Overpass. I think Project Overpass solves one of Web3's biggest problems. And that problem is licensing at scale on chain. We were the first major project to license IP from our holders. And I was wondering why until we did it. And then when we did it, I understood why, because it's a huge pain in the ass. It is not easy to do. It takes weeks, if not months, to get the deals done. But there should be a Web3 native way to do this. And we solved this with the Project Overpass. So hopefully, uh, really excited this, to give that the technology. licensing platform, the licensing platform yeah. that you guys built, basically? Got it. Yeah. So it's going to be available to our community at first, and then we'll open it up to other communities and kind of will be our gift to the NFT space and kind of solve a lot of utility problems for a lot of projects. Because to be frank, I think that's the purest, most kosher, most above board form of utility you can possibly do for between holder and brand is, hey, I'm building a brand, I'm making products, I'm making content, let me pay you for the right to use your your character in these assets. It's pretty mm -hmm. obvious, completely above board. No one can question that in any shape, way, or form. So um, yeah, I'm excited for that. those two things before the year's over. Hmm. Nice, man. You tweeted uh, two weeks ago, Pudgy Penguins has one of the biggest announcements in the history of, the, of Web3 coming in Q4. You just mentioned, mentioned it. Can you share anything about it? Uh, I probably can't because I want to keep it fun, but I think I'll, it's, I'll make, it's, deal, I'll make it's, a deal with you. I'll make a deal with you right now. I will buy, I don't own any pudgies. I will buy a pudgy right now. If you share some info on it. Uh, let's see what I can do. I think, I think it's really <laughs> about, um, I think it's proliferation and my thesis personified. I think when I make this announcement, everything I talked about with you on this podcast will be undeniable. I think I think it's not going to be like oh he's he's doing it or he's on the right path. I think when you see that moment you'll be like holy fuck this 25 year old in southern Florida really fucking did it and outdid dudes twice my age with twice 10 times the reputation that I have you know and I fucking did it. And I think that's what you're going to think when you see it. Nice man. All right. I'm still buying a pudgy anyways. I'm going to buy this thing. Um <laughs> uh are you guys going to raise any more money? What's the, what do you think the future of like financing for the business looks like? Yeah, maybe, probably. I'm not in the business of raising money just to raise rounds. So like one thing I won't do is like, I'm not going to raise valuations just to like, in a bull market, we could probably raise it a billion dollar valuation, right? If by the, like, if we continue on the trajectory that we're going and the bull market rage is better than the one before it. Like it's probably a clear path, but I don't want to raise just to have that my ego stroke. Like I only want to raise to have a purpose. And honestly, right. like I'm a firm believer that you got to be a little uncomfortable to win. You got to be a little hungry. I, I look I look at some of these projects and like, why are you failing? Like why you have so much money? And probably the reason why they're failing is because they have so much money. And it's just like, you're paying yourself a crazy salary, you know, so many, so much excess heads and employees in the workforce, like no shit. You're probably just kicking back at your office for four hours with a pina colada. Like the, though you don't, you would never admit it. Like I could understand why you would do that. So I just want to stay hungry and I, and I'm not here to, I'm here to, you know, like if there's, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, yeah. I think. The goal is to not, right? Like the goal is the goal in a perfect world is I take this thing all the way through and we ride this thing as a legacy business and this round of financing that we took in was it. But if there's a real path to grow and we're really hitting things on a nail and there's a, there's a moment to make, you know, uh, to, to bring in more cash for the business, I think there's too many variables for me to tell you in a perfect world, the answer would be no though. Yeah. All right, man. How, what, what do I... I'm looking at these pudgies here. What's a, what's a, how do I buy these pudgies? What's a good trait to get? How do I, what's it's, the, what's hot in the pudgy? It's the, it's the gold skin and the ice skin, man. Show us what the block works bankroll is made of. <laughs> <laughs> the gold skin and the ice skin. All right. Give me something. Cheap yeah. You, you know, the, the, the ethos with the penguins, we have a motto or a tagline and it is, I am my penguin. My penguin is me. Pick a penguin that you resonate with, that you identify with, right? The one that you could be like, this is me. And that's really the thing with the penguins. It's not these are like, cute, man. I'm looking through these. I like these things. 
This is funny. They're good. They're round. They have the contour bias. If you're familiar with the universal principles of design, like there's yeah. definitely like yeah. there's something magical. It's actually people underestimate this. Frank puts a huge emphasis. There's a science to a good PFP. They don't just happen. Like there's a real science to them. And Pudgy Penguins also checks off a lot of those boxes for the science of what makes a good PFP. Interesting. All right, man. Anything else that we missed? No, dude, but this was a badass interview. Thanks for having me. Yeah, appreciate it. Pumped uh, to see what you guys do. I'm actually going to snag one of these penguins. So this will be, uh, I got to find one that kind of looks like me. Yeah. So, anyways, man, it's a pleasure. Appreciate you coming on. Appreciate the time as always. And uh, I will, I'm sure uh, you'll be back on here at some point soon. So I appreciate it. And dude, continue the great work. And thanks for having me. I know you didn't have to, so I appreciate it. Thanks, man.